It is April 19th, 1775, and John Hancock is asleep at his childhood home in Lexington, Massachusetts. Now, Hancock doesn't live there anymore. He lives in Boston, but uh, Hancock and his buddy Samuel Adams are concerned that if they go back to Boston, they're gonna get arrested by the British. So for now, they're kind of camped out, you know, hiding out in Lexington. Now, at some point after midnight, they hear some commotion outside, uh, and then Paul Revere pops through the door. Hey, the British are coming, he says, catching his breath, and they're coming for you. Now, the Patriots had received some intelligence that at some point that night, British soldiers were gonna march over to Lexington and arrest uh, John Hancock and Samuel Adams. So as soon as they hear this, uh, Hancock pops up and he starts getting ready, right? He's gonna go outside and he's gonna meet these guys and he's gonna battle them if necessary. Uh, until Paul Revere and others say, hey, look guys, you're way better off, you're more valuable to us as political leaders than political prisoners, so why don't you get your stuff and just march out of town? And that's what they do. Now, a few hours later, after 5 a.m., the British troops do come rolling into Lexington, and they find 77 armed colonists standing on the Lexington Green. Now, these guys are not soldiers, right? They're, they're farmers and cabinet makers and blacksmiths. They're holding weapons that are made for hunting, not for the battlefield, but they're ready to confront the British. And for a while, both sides are just kind of looking at each other in a standoff, not doing or saying anything. Then all of a sudden, boom, the shot heard round the world. No one is sure who fired that first shot. But what is known is that the next 15 minutes were total bloody chaos. And at the end of it, eight colonists lay dead on the Lexington Green. And the, uh, the British, they've moved on. They have no casualties. They've decided to march six miles over to the town of Concord, where they planned to capture and destroy a whole bunch of supposedly hidden colonial weapons. Now, by the time they get to Concord, they have a nice little surprise waiting for them. Why? Well, because the colonists in Concord, they had also been warned that the British were coming. And so by the time the British got there, thousands and thousands of militiamen called Minutemen had descended upon Concord and they were ready to meet the British. So a massive battle breaks out, bullets are flying everywhere. And uh, this time the outcome is a little different for the British. 73 British soldiers are killed, 174 more are wounded, and the British are just battered, beaten, and bloodied, and they retreat. They decide to sort of hobble their way back to Boston and the colonists chase them all the way back um, and then they form a circle around the city of Boston and basically keep the, uh, the British troops trapped inside. This is called the Siege of Boston. About a month later, colonial leaders meet in Philadelphia for the Second Continental Congress. And John Hancock actually pops back up and he's elected president of the Second Continental Congress. Now, while these guys are meeting in Philadelphia, the Siege of Boston is still going on and it's getting bigger. By this point, other colonies have decided to send men to help out. So Connecticut, New Hampshire, of course, Massachusetts, and all of these colonies have decided to put this guy, Artemis Ward, in charge of their troops. They've named him commander-in-chief of their troops, right? But Second Continental Congress has a much bigger idea. They want to create a bigger army, a continental army, with men from all 13 colonies to fight the British. So they go ahead and they take a vote, they create the army, and then they have a decision to make, right? Well, who's gonna lead this newly created continental army? Now, some people are saying, look, let's just leave uh, Artemis Ward there, right? Seems to be doing a good job. If it ain't broke, don't fix it. And besides, the fighting is taking place in Massachusetts. He's from Massachusetts. It makes total sense. Uh, then John Hancock is actually kind of popping his hand up saying, yeah, I kind of want the job myself. And then you've got this guy. I mean, th this guy actually showed up at the Second Continental Congress wearing a military uniform. Then he ran into town. He bought five military books, three coverings for his holsters, and a tomahawk, right? So he's basically signaling to everybody, I'm, I'm ready for the fight. Congress starts debating who they're going to put in charge. And then a delegate from Massachusetts named John Adams stands up and he says, I nominate George Washington from Virginia. And then he shoots a look over to his friend from Massachusetts, 
John Hancock. And he's like, yeah, I'm pretty sure John Hancock just unfriended me. He said he later writes that uh, he just, you know, could see the anger dripping from Hancock's face. He says, I never remarked a more sudden and sinking change of countenance. Mortification and resentment were expressed as forcibly as his face could exhibit them. So after Adams makes his motion, George Washington stands up and he kind of slips out of the room. He figures, let me let these guys debate, you know, without me here. It's kind of the gentlemanly thing to do. Now, everybody in the room likes and respects George Washington. But the fact is that his military record from 20 years ago in the French and Indian War, it was a little shaky. Uh, but he is the tallest guy in the room at six foot two. He's bold. He's brave. And he's also from Virginia, which is great because having a general from the South leading a fight in the North actually brings the colonies together. And it sends a message to King George and Britain that everyone is in on this fight. So after two days of debating Washington's qualifications, the Continental Congress votes unanimously to appoint him as commander in chief of the Continental Army. Washington accepts the appointment and he declines the salary, which is great because at this point, nobody knows who's going to pay for the Continental Army. Um, and then he stands up and he gives an acceptance speech where he basically says, listen, guys, I'm going to do this job, uh, but I don't really think I'm qualified for it. And if things don't go great, then, you know, just don't blame me. I told you so. Uh, he says it a little more eloquently than that. He says, lest some unlucky event should happen, unfavorable to my reputation, I beg it may be remembered by every gentleman in the room that I, this day, declare with the utmost sincerity, I do not think myself equal to the command I'm honored with. Then he writes a letter to his wife where he basically says, hey, honey, uh, these guys picked me as commander in chief of this continental army. And uh, he says, this is a trust too great for my capacity. But he tells her, I'm going up to Boston and I don't know if or when I'm going to see you again. And, and, and I'm sure his wife found this very comforting. Included in the letter, uh, he included his will. And he tells his wife, he says, the provision made for you in case of my death will, I hope, be agreeable. Now, I, I want to take a second here and just pause and, and just appreciate for a minute what's going on. I mean, George Washington, the minute he accepted appointment as commander in chief, became, you know, enemy number one to the British. I mean, that's treason in the highest degree, a certain death sentence. He also took on a task that was almost impossible to lead a fight against the world's most powerful military. So he was basically signing up for something that was almost certain to lead uh, to some sort of disastrous result. But he did it anyway because he believed in the cause. Now, the day after Washington is appointed commander in chief, as he's getting ready to leave Philadelphia, a young delegate from Virginia is arriving to Philadelphia for the very first time to replace another guy who, who basically had to go back home. Now, this young replacement delegate is named Thomas Jefferson. He is not happy to be there, but he is about to become spectacularly famous. And we're going to talk about that in the next video.